9th of March 2024, Trevor's gone back to where he lives in uh, by bus. He lives in a town in Norfolk. There are several active Christian churches there. And uh, we pray for unity. We pray for unity there, that the churches will be one as God himself is one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, connected to this morning's video, which we'll upload shortly, the, the theme, you can look on this as part two. We're not going to go through the scriptures again. They've been established in this morning's video, uh, which was uh, Genesis 3, 8 to 15, uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, and Romans 8, 1 to 17. So I recommend you look at the first video first before going straight into this one. But this one stands alone in its own right, as it were. The theme this morning was worldly people versus godly people. The spirit of this world versus the spirit of God. The spirit of this world versus the Holy Spirit. And that is the background, not to just to these videos today, but generally our life in Christ, that we're in Christ, in this world, but not of this world. No more than Jesus, who was physically in this world, fully human, but fully God, Jesus was physically in this world, but of course he was not of this world. He came to do the will of God the Father, the one who sent him. He came to do God's will, and in fact Jesus made a statement that his food, day and night, was to do the will of the one who sent him, Father God. And remember, Jesus was fully human, but he was fully God. The image of God, the fullness of God, dwelt in Christ, the man. The Spirit of God in a man. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate. Fully human, but fully God. And of course, we read this morning from Romans 8 uh, and, and 1, John 3, uh, 1 John 2 that Jesus was in the form of human flesh, but of course Jesus did not have sinful nature. But he was tempted, as every person is tempted. So Jesus resisted the temptation, but he could be tempted because he was fully human. And there's no temptation known to man that Jesus Christ, as a fully human being, was not tempted with. Of course, the enemy had a way of infiltrating the thoughts audibly or in the spiritual realm. So if we perceive the thoughts of God by the Holy Spirit, and we do, as born-again disciples of Christ, of course Jesus was in 100% absolute communion with his Father, day and night, 100%. But of course Jesus knew the voice of the enemy. Jesus knew the messengers from Satan. Jesus knew the sons of the devil, the Pharisees. Jesus knew. Omniscient God. Jesus knew. He understood the human condition. We're in a spiritual battle today. I'm going to make some statements and I want you to maybe get a piece of paper and a pen and a piece of blank paper and uh, put on pause now if you like to get those things ready because this is, if you like, I'm going to make some statements and I want you to mark on your piece of paper for your own benefit, maybe in your twos and threes, even a house group situation, for a discussion point. So I'm going to make some statements here 
true or false or anything in between a percentage of a hundred percent true hundred percent false or any percentage in between it's generally wrong to generalize and of course we do generalize to make a point but let me make a start on this some people think all policemen are good some people who live in certain poor areas of Norwich UK I've heard them say it all coppers are brackets not good only they use a swear word so the truth is somewhere in between generally all policemen are good there's a screening process there's a vetting process there's an interview process to weed out the bad apples from the barrel of apples and one bad apple can spoil the whole barrel so there's a, a screening process in an interview the training to weed out quotes bad policemen so generally the vast majority of policemen in the uh, England let's just restrict it to England for now the vast majority of policemen in England are relatively good as opposed to relatively evil wicked or bad sinful so when you bring into the equation the majority of policemen are good but of course the majority of policemen are still sinful they still have sinful nature of course of course everybody still has sinful nature <clears throat> but as we read this morning Jesus came in the form of human flesh but without sinful nature <clears throat> but of course he could have sinned he knew what sin was but he was a virgin he was a righteous Jew obeyed all the laws of the country the Ten Commandments and whatever laws were there and of course his righteous Jewish parents Joseph and Mary would have brought up the boy Jesus to be a good boy to obey Yahweh to obey the law uh, to go to the local synagogue the shul the school and to be taught to read and write numeracy how to get by in life on a human level and that, and that was Jesus upbringing a, a baby a toddler a preteen a teenager and an adult man of course it goes without saying but we must say it for the sake of clarity Jesus was a virgin Jesus obeyed the law of the Jews and he lived a righteous life a pure holy righteous life and he never had sex because sex outside marriage is called fornication and Jesus never sinned he was tempted in every way but yet did not sin and, and did girls around his life tempt him of course teenage girls start to experience a hormonal change and their chemistry they're starting to look for a mate starting to look for a life partner in any culture the girls look at the boys and the boys look at the girls looking at the boys and Jesus controlled himself but going back to the police generally the police are good people they're there to uphold the law they're there to make the peace peacekeepers or peacemakers so within the police force in the England or Norwich UK in every police force as I understand it there is something called the CPA the Christian Police Association so the Christian Police Association is an association 
of Christian police who associate with each other. So these are policemen who are happy to say publicly they are Christian and they belong to the CPA, the Christian Police Association, and they meet in their meetings in but not of the police force itself. Although they always remain policemen, they might be in or out of uniform, but when they meet with the CPA as a body of Christians, they are spiritually in a different place. So there will be some across the cross-section of CPA who might be from all different types of denominations. Let's take a hundred uh, police men and police women in Norwich UK and Norfolk UK. Let's say out of a hundred there will be a cross-section of different types of Christian. And I don't know what the purpose or remit of the CPA is, literally. I could look it up, I could quote it, but you could do that yourself. The CPA in England and what their beliefs are, whether they have a creed, a basis of unity around a certain creed. And do they have a membership? Do members have to pay? All of that you can check for yourself. But within the police force, there are across a hundred percent of policemen, there'll be different faiths. There will be Christians. There will be Jewish believers. There will be Muslim believers. There will be Hindu believers, Buddhists, and you can name it Quakers, all sorts of people with all sorts of religious beliefs in the police force. And their common purpose, of course, they're, they're hired to keep the peace, to make the peace, to keep the peace, to uphold the law, to make arrests, to prevent crime if possible, or to solve crime if possible. And that is the remit, the remit of the police force generally in every country. So we're establishing a statement that all police are basically good in a cross section of 0% to 100% and somewhere in between. Somewhere in between, there is a line of assessment or judgment and there are good cops and very few, hopefully, 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 very few bad cops in the definition of what is good and bad. Different religions, even amongst Christianity, amongst the police, there'll be different types of Christians in the CPA and some of them will not be born again. That doesn't make them bad people. That means that they don't know what it is to be born again, because once you know what it is to be born again, you'll want to be born again. You'll want to enter into Christ, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Not by rituals, not by ceremonies, not by programs, but by the grace of God. Once you truly admit, I'm a sinner, my sin separates me from God for eternity. And I, I don't want to be separated from God for eternity. Therefore, what must I do to be saved? Now, I don't know whether the CPA, the Christian Police Association, get into an evangelical approach to all their members of the CPA. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm pretty sure they're not allowed to evangelize non-members of the CPA. 
they're not allowed to uh, promote the gospel of Jesus Christ to people of other religions and none. This is 2024. Are they allowed to preach the gospel? Are they allowed to talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world, the crucifixion? Are they allowed to talk about the blood of the Lamb? Are they even allowed to give their own testimonies publicly to their colleagues who are colleagues of other religions and none? I don't know, but I doubt it. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the CPA are allowed to approach other non-members of the CPA. But of course, thinking about it logically, I don't know, you can look it into it yourself. Is there a, a, a Muslim version, Muslim P Police Association, MPA? Is there a JPA, a, Jew, a Jewish Police Association? Is there a BPA, a Buddhist Police Association? I don't know. But what I do know, there is a trend generally in this country and most Western countries by now called multi-faith. Multi-faithism. So is there a move amongst the police force to have multi-faith police association? MFPA. Now I'm not being facetious. I'm being logical and rational in the way the trends are in any association, the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. Originally, it wasn't a company, it was an association of associates with a common belief in Christ, the YMCA, Christian Men's Association, Christian Women's Association. And I know 30 odd years ago, I was, a, I was employed by the YMCA in Norwich, UK. And I learned that in America, there was a move in America to drop the title YMCA to, to just make it the Y. Just the letter Y, the Y. And of course, this was marketing, this was reducing the YMCA, taking the Christianity element out and turning the Y and all the hostels into a just a generic hostel. And of course, money is involved. So the Y became known as just hostels, the Y hostels. And this has been a trend over the last 30 years or so to drop the, the word Christian or Christianity. And this trend has continued. So you can apply that to all other fields and professions. Psychiatry. Are there any born again Christian psychiatrists? I would say doubtful. Born again Christian psychiatrist i would say doubtful towards the naught percent why because psychiatrists uh, usually focus on the medication what about christian psychologists well i would say again it's not a hundred percent born again spirit-filled christian psychologists the percentage will be better than so-called christian psychiatrists because psychologists believe more in the talking therapies rather than the medication. Although they do agree that with psychiatry, it's all about the meds. Psychology, it is all about talking therapies and the meds they allow for that. So what about counsellors? Are all counsellors 100% Christian? Absolutely not, because you have secular counselling, Rogerian counselling, Freudian counselling, emotional counselling, 
well-being counselling, person-centred counselling, even Christian counselling. But of course the Holy Spirit, he himself, he is the counsellor, the counsellor. He, the Holy Spirit, counsels us, guides us into all truth, one truth at a time, not least of which about yourself, about how you work in your spirit and your soul, your psyche. This is how we are, this is how we're made. Jesus, God, has made us in his image. God has made us in his image. Spirit. A spiritual image of God is within each one of us, but if you like, that image doesn't come alive until you're born of God. Yes, you can be a good person, relatively. God is good. Yes, you can be a good person, a charitable person, altruistic, kind, generous. You could be like God, in the image of God, because we're all made in the image of God. Adam and Eve were made in God's image. The image of Father, Son, Holy Spirit is within human beings, made in the image of God. But that doesn't mean we're the children of God. Not until you find the Father God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then only by repentance, by the blood of the Lamb, can you enter in to Christ, the way to God, the way to the Father. There's only one way to the Father, Jesus Christ himself, the only begotten Son. And only by grace, only by mercy, only by the forgiveness of sins can you enter in to God's presence permanently, forever, in eternity. But you must be born again. You must have your sins dealt with by the blood of the Lamb. And it's not a form of words. You can't pronounce the blood of the Lamb over yourself many times just to cure yourself of sin as a sickness, as a disease. You can't chant the name of Jesus repetitively to make yourself clean by the blood of the Lamb. You must be born again. You must be born again. And once you're born again, there's a process has begun that you have received the Holy Spirit. You have received the forgiveness of sins because of Jesus' blood. And the blood of the Lamb cleanses you from all sin. And your spiritual house becomes clean by the blood of the Lamb. And we're talking spiritually, we're not talking physically. You don't have to sprinkle physical blood in your house, on all the walls and the floors and the ceiling. You do not have to do that. You don't have to put blood, physical blood of a physical lamb, on the doors of your house and the lintel. You don't have to. Because we're talking about spiritual cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ, not the physical blood of Jesus. And let's be clear, the red wine doesn't become the blood, no more than the bread, whether it's got yeast bread or unleavened bread, that bread doesn't become Jesus either. Absolutely not. I'm making some bold statements here. You either believe this is 100% true or 100% false. But when we're talking about the blood of Jesus, you have to understand by the scriptures that are already written, Holy Spirit breathed scripture and the Holy Spirit himself and the fellowship of believers where we know that the red wine does not become the blood. 
we know that the bread in whatever form it is does not become the body. But we do break bread and we remember Jesus. His body was broken. When we look at the red wine, we see that the blood of Jesus was shed. So I want to leave it there. Discern the body of Christ before you, quotes, take communion. Discern the body, as the Bible teaches us. God bless you. We'll talk again soon. God willing. God bless.